a technical writer with Sousa and an advisor to Mavisa. Uh, but before working in the open source space, I was you know, into the systems engineering uh, side of things within IT. And uh, honestly speaking, my segue into open source was with Kubernetes uh, and not Linux, which is funny because I worked on a lot of uh, uh, Linux systems and was uh, responsible for a lot of Linux administration in my jobs. Uh, but my, uh, you know, segue, like I said, was via Kubernetes. And I'm here speaking to you really uh, because I stood on the shoulders of giants and uh, um, it was because of the uh, mentorship opportunities that I have had personally um, that I was able to um, grow in my career and in my journey within open source. So uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't give them credit. Uh, but I also recognize that despite all the mentorship programs, initiatives, uh, whether formal or informal, that we have within the technology space, um, mentorship um, opportunities or uh, pro programs or initiatives, or whatever you call them, uh, they suffer from uh, various problems um, because uh, despite all the good intentions that go behind these uh, initiatives, um, uh, there are certain factors that we still don't recognize as, um, you know, um, hindering the progress or uh, capturing the effectiveness of these uh, inter, um, in, uh, initiatives. So with this session, uh, hopefully what I aim to do is to walk you all through some of the common breakdowns and uh, hopefully arm you all with some uh, actionable takeaways to sort of prevent them in your respective projects or wherever you're implementing these uh, initiatives. So uh, hopefully that sets some, sets some context and uh, let's dive right in, honestly. Uh, now I know that everybody here knows what mentorship is, um, but I'll be speeding through this one. Um, and typically in a mentorship effort, uh, what tends to happen is there's a person or a set of people who are newcomers to the system, uh, whole ecosystem, whether it be the technology one or whether wherever else this initiative is taken, uh, taking place. And there's a person who is slightly more experienced in that whole setup. So there is um, uh, maybe, uh, I wouldn't say it's a bi-directional exchange here, but it's more of a, um, you know, um, initiative where the more experienced person takes on the um, uh, role of a mentor to handhold and guide the new entrant to the uh, ecosystem in and help them navigate the ecosystem. Uh, now, mentorship in open source isn't really widely different because um, it's obvious that there is still a, a mapping between the mentor and the mentee. That's definitely there. Um, however, given the flux that open source uh, is always in, uh, mentors are typically folks within uh, the community who have slightly more experience. Uh, this doesn't necessarily translate to someone who's more older than you or um, who has more years of experience in the industry, but it's literally a person within that ecosystem who is more experienced and who has been around for longer, so they know a little better about how to navigate and how to, you know, um, best position a person within the ecosystem so that they can, uh, you know, contribute more effectively. Uh, how is this also an additional community aspect um, factored into this loop? Um, so what does that exactly mean? Uh, typically in, you know, traditional mentorship setups, what happens is you have a mentor, you have a mentee, and the interaction is pretty much limited to them within the whole program. Uh, but in, unlike in a traditional format, what happens in open source is that uh, there's also the wider community that's factored into this loop. Um, so to draw from a personal reference, when I worked, uh, on, with the uh, CERN on the Google season of docs, um, I was not expected to just work with the three sets of, uh, not three sets, three mentors that I had um, and, you know, interact with just them. I was expected to seek community feedback from uh, other people 
who previously worked on uh, you know code uh, code on the code base who were working on the code base who were users of the code base so that i could effectively contribute in that mentorship program uh, this uh, included previous participants of uh, not just you know google season of dogs but other outreach programs as well uh, other staff within cern and other academicians uh, who were accessing the uh, documentation but like i said uh, due to the inherent uh, voluntary nature of open source uh, mentorship opportunities within open source aren't effectively able to provide the support and um, you know onboard uh, a mentee as eff uh, as effectively as we would want to uh, now i'm not saying that it's like a 100% failure rate that is not what i'm intending to convey but um, you know we could do things better there's always room for improvement and uh, what are the reasons behind those uh, you know failures that we uh, failures or those breakdowns that we speak of uh, so these are the four areas where you uh, you know see mentorship programs typically failing uh, whether they are formal or informal in nature because uh, not every uh, mentorship program has like a titular mentor, uh, at least in open source, I went through many mentorship, I went through many mentors um, who weren't titled as mentors, they just really were hand, hand holding me throughout the process. So um, I had initially planned for this whole uh, session to be like a, a curation of research papers, but I realized that that would be no fun because uh, it would be very dry and honestly speaking, uh, nobody would really gain any benefit. Uh, so uh, what I choose to do is to uh, go through each of these breakdowns and draw from personal references again so that it's more, uh, you know, real life as they say and uh, um, hopefully that uh, you know gives you an idea and I'm also going to you know then share what actually worked for us uh, both uh, not just as a community but as a um, you know contributor as well so uh, hopefully that is uh, you know able to give you a better picture of uh, how to go about navigating that breakdown. So the first one up is procedural breakdowns um, and the onus of this um, you know majorly falls in the community or the mentor is what is a common belief but um, uh, you know it's not just that uh, honestly speaking uh, when I say you know laying out the scope and context it's not just from the mentor's perspective or from the program's perspective that that should be an initiative there should be a self-assessment from the uh, mentee side as well as to what they are capable of when applying for a mentorship program or while seeking out a mentorship because that's something that is uh, you know uh, grossly undervalued as uh, you know a thing that uh, goes on during mentorship programs uh, people don't know what they want to be mentored in people don't understand what are their skill sets people don't understand where they are standing currently and where they want to be and um, of course there is a whole community aspect to it as well which we shall get into the next couple of slides but that initial self-assessment by the candidate who's seeking out mentorship is absolutely essential and without that uh, you know uh, both the mentor the mentee and the community in general is setting themselves up for failure really when it comes to this whole program so uh, when i started out personally i remember that i wanted to do a bunch of things i wanted to um, learn every well, you know cloud native technology that was there on that landscape um, and uh, that was putting it very mildly i signed up on a bunch of slack channels i um, you know reached out to everybody i could find uh, who i could you know ask for work from but that was a mistake on my part because i should have clearly assessed what was my capability and what i could offer and what i could bring to the table and what i wanted to grow um, into rather than you know just taking on a bunch of uh, responsibilities and spreading myself thin 
um, but there is this whole concept of you know also welcoming people into the community there are um, you know not just cloud native tech but outside of cloud native tech wherever these mentorship programs are in place there is a whole concept of welcoming people into the community and you know showing them around it's just plain courtesy when you look at it but that's that's an important step and it's a step a lot of us miss out on uh, primarily because who wants to be actually you know the person who actually hand holds them and shows them hey this is the you know place where you start off at this is what you do it's just plain courtesy and it sounds like rubbish when i'm actually saying it but it's it's that important step when you go into a community that you actually tell people that you know the, the new entrant that this is this is how stuff works now every you know every community cannot afford to do that in uh, you know with every uh, uh, contributor every single person cannot be mapped to one person which is why you know within the kubernetes community which i'm uh, part of at least that's the only experience i can speak to so um, um, within the kubernetes community we have a named role for this this is a new contributor ambassador now uh, it might not seem like much because you know how does it make a difference when you know the first person who actually comes and interacts with you is warm but it makes a really really big difference when that person is actually very welcoming and is offering you help um i can speak from personal experience because had my first um interactions not been warm and welcoming and were they all you know cold and rude i probably wouldn't have been speaking in front of you all today uh because it's the people who matter at the end of the day uh the community is made up of people right so uh honestly speaking it's the people who matter and uh, uh the tech comes second and that's something i always believe in um again going back to my efforts it's um you know uh my uh, mentors and official and official they basically pointed me to resources uh, where i could learn more they urged me to take on more responsibilities and sometimes even you know nominated me for positions i didn't think myself worthy of uh, they did that with my consent of course but uh, this is something that i think really helps uh, having that human touch um having a face to actually uh, you know onboard newer members it need not be you know a role that is exactly similar to this but there should be someone who does this um and whatever name you choose to give it is obviously upon you it helps the connections build and uh, you know there is proof uh, several research papers who uh you know go into uh, measuring retention capacity for people who come into open source new contributors who enter into open source those folks have confirmed that you know a positive socialization experience at the start of every new contributor's journey actually does help um you know in retaining them within the community and we all know how difficult it is to actually have voluntary contributors within open source so it's it's a challenge and uh, uh this is just one of the ways obviously to address that now uh honestly speaking uh you know that's uh, one aspect of you know welcoming is one aspect but once you're in once you have completed your first task what's next because like you wouldn't know where to go because you're new and it's like you know you have to go down a rabbit hole to find your next good issue or good task that you can work on so you know having a new contributor ambassador and all of that roles help but also you know having a uh, sign post maybe in your documentation or somewhere in your uh, you know uh, in the avenues where you interact really helps now if i actually take a step back here and go back to my own experience um having uh, in the within the kubernetes community again there are uh, you know there's a contributor ladder sorry so the contributor ladders in general um uh, again help uh, you know uh, help us uh, help the contributors aspire to a higher role or a higher um, you know position within the community that's one side 
but even when you are talking about different areas within the same community um all these uh, issues wherein you know you need help and um, you need if you tag them appropriately even within the avenue where you're troubleshooting these issues those are good ways to actually attract contributors um so having a contributor ladder is just one way of gamifying the whole experience for a new contributor because you know you um, believe it or not all of us uh, here um even though i don't personally like playing games um on the laptop or wherever uh, we we're, we're all you know living in a very gamified world um slaying demons getting that uh, title getting a promotion is all setting off the same pathways in our brain it's like tick, tick, uh, ticking off the checklist and moving on to the next level so um contribution ladder is one of the ways that you can achieve that gamification within your project uh but like i said for all this to happen that very first step where the new contributor assesses themselves is extremely important because all this comes into play when you are aware of what you are able to do and can, uh, will be able to do given you know the appropriate tools and the technology so uh, context and scope whether it's in the on the side of the community or whether it's on the side of um you know the person who's actually seeking mentorship is absolutely important um now scope and context in informal pairings is easy because you have that personal channel you can just reach out and clarify that you know hey this is what i was intending to do and i think i might have gone a bit astray but when it's like a one to many mentorship um it's going to be a bit more of a problem um and when we talk about formal mentorship programs i'm sure that you know the person obviously has uh, responsibilities more than just mentorship it's going to be you know being uh, an experienced contributor their day lives uh, i mean their day jobs sorry their uh, normal lives all of that comes into the picture um so how do you actually help with context setting in that case and how do you help define the scope of the program now uh, when you uh, talk about so setting the context and forming the scope um first understanding the contributor is necessary so having that first initial um, conversation with the contributor and understanding where they come from is necessary uh, obviously you can only go so far as to trust their words and uh, then you know go with a an actual assessment uh, when i started out um, with you know the google season of docs uh, program at cern they actually just gave me an assessment and told me to you know write a whole thing about um the rusio uh, system that i was working on and i had to actually because i was involved with the kubernetes community and that's something they saw uh, they were asking me to describe a rusio on ke its installation and because it was documentation it was very relevant but having that first stage of assessment really helped them understand what i could bring to the table not just with respect to describing the whole uh, system uh, but in understanding whether i could actually describe it succinctly and you know make a document out of it um so that's one thing but um, there was there's also the con uh, concept of an entry level barrier when we come in uh, in most technical communities in um, you know as of now i think one of the biggest entry level barriers that a newcomer faces when joining an open source project in the technical space is learning git um, and that's a common refrain i have heard because they're like how the hell am i going to finish learning uh, you know uh, git in one day it's like it's not going to be a day it's going to be more you know it's going to be an ongoing process but understanding that that needs to be learned and documenting that somewhere is um, an onus on the community members saying that these need to be the prerequisites that you need to have before you come in uh, i agree that there is that 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 is a significant entry level barrier to cross but uh, that needs to be there because otherwise there is going to be a whole uh, you know there's going to be a whole uh, uh, influx of contributors who have nothing to do and aren't able to contribute effectively and a whole cohort of maintain, uh, maintainers and ment uh, mentors and experienced contributors who are taking on more than their share of work 
So setting the expectations right at the beginning is important and that's why having that initial assessment self and with your mentor and um, you know documenting your entry level barriers clearly is important. Um, now I've you know stayed quite along on the procedural part of it. But uh, let's look at a more uh, familiar area of breakdown, which is technical. Uh, so I have been personally traumatized by the phrase, uh, but it works on my machine. That's, that's something that gives me nightmares because honestly, I've been in production support for way too long. So uh, it's, it's been the bane of my life to listen to people say it works on my machine when you know millions of dollars are stuck in payments. Uh, but I guess that's a topic for my next CFP. Um, so technical breakdowns are common uh, because you know not everybody has the same workstation, um, or and workstations really differ in the kind of uh, you know specs that they su uh, support, whether it be uh, you know the computer architecture, the software that can be downloaded etc etc I mean I don't need to go too deep into that but uh, to again go back to myself I had a gaming laptop that could not even install a KH cluster uh, when I started out and it significantly impeded the way I actually started out with Kubernetes so that's where I think uh, stuff like ephemeral dev environments and um, browser-based IDEs come into the picture, right? Um, I know that these are very recent things that have come into existence and these folks have not paid me to say any of this, but I think it's a very great way to integrate more accessibility, accessibility into our projects. Uh, I don't know if there's a hardware equivalent of this really, so uh, that's a question I, uh, you know, I have personally for people who are you know, working on programs, uh, mentorship programs that involve hardware as well. So I do not have any idea about that, but for software-based stuff, uh, such things are a boon because it helps irrespective of the, uh, you know, internet, um, you know, slowness of the internet connection or, you know, the spec that you have on your laptop. Uh, you're able to, uh, you know, navigate or set up a cluster or, do whatever it is. I'm now I'm, I've gone too deep into Kubernetes, so every time I say something, it's setting up a cluster that first comes to my mind as an example. But uh, in general, that's something that really helps in the software side of things. Now, uh, uh, that was a very brief brief stop at technical breakdowns. Uh, the next one up on the uh, circle was um, the personal breakdowns. Um, and it's an interesting uh, focus point here because we're back to talking about humans again. Uh, so it could be both from the mentor as well as the mentee perspective. Uh, but I will be focusing on the mentor side of things here because I think it has a slightly uh, more, uh, slightly more, it has slightly more impact as compared to the mentee one. Uh, in the first couple of slides, I did say that, you know, uh, mentorship in open source has three broad components which are like the mentor, mentee and the community. Uh, the mentor is a slightly more experienced person and then you know mentee is actually seeking to gain more experience. Um, given which you know the mentor probably has more elevated responsibilities and a day job and a life um, whether voluntary or paid uh, that's a lot of things on one plate uh, and honestly speaking um, if if you've looked if the past couple of years is anything is any indication of the future um, all of this is going to be extremely difficult because um, at least it has taught me the value of time management uh, and context switching uh, the reason being uh, when you're when you're required to context switch um, between a day job, between a mentorship, um, you know, initiative that you're a part of, between the open source, other open source, you know, uh, tasks that you must complete, uh, your personal life on the back burner, all of that comes together and 
is it's very easy for you to spiral down into burnout um, especially in remote setups now a lot of us have moved back to offices but with remote setups i feel like that's um, it's very uh, you know easy to spiral into burnout if you do not have uh, an effective strategy for time management and context switching um i would rather not recommend context switching at all because it's it's honestly a very ineffective way of um, you know it's day of dedicating time and um, of blocking out time uh, but um, if you are a jedi level procrastinator like me all of this is even more uh, difficult um which is why if you're a mentor or a mentee really or just like any normal human being if you're just even floating around in space you need to find strategies that work for you with respect to time management uh another thing uh is that um with personal breakdowns uh there is this problem which is actually not a problem if there aren't way too many uh mentees but uh one to way too many mentorship is a serious problem uh, in general if uh, you know there's already a lot on your plate um so i know that a lot of mentors don't have a say in how many mentees they take on but uh, that's something that needs to be changed if you do have the power to do that because unless you actually are able to you know take on that much load you should not be uh, because neither is it going to be good for the people who you are mentoring or for the community for you know whom this effort is in place it's not going to be it's going to be a lose lose situation for everyone involved um and obviously not for uh, uh, it's definitely going to be a lose lose situation for you as well um and i think this is something nadia ikbal uh, who wrote the book working in public sort of covered very nicely um it's aimed it's not aimed at dissing any mentorship programs really but uh, coupled with the fact that most of these programs don't actually uh, do a good job of uh, scoping out and uh, that initial context setting how how they go how they go about doing it is not really done well uh, there is a, an added pressure on experienced contributors and maintainers to uh, you know course correct and uh, uh, you know go above and beyond for the mentees which is okay up to a point but after that point it becomes a burden on the experienced contributor or maintainer because they obviously are doing so much more uh, than just you know the mentoring opportunity but now that i have covered all of this uh, this is like the last section of my presentation dealing with interpersonal breakdowns um and throughout these past uh, two years uh, i'm sure some of these are you know very relevant um given that we were all remote for a really long time it feels like a long time now um whether it be struggling with time zones uh, and not being able to attend that zoom meeting at uh, you know 4 am in my time or you know struggling with uh, keeping up with the cultural difference um it's it's difficult because we're all very different here and we're all um you know probably going to identify with different uh, genders religious preferences dietary preferences etc um i'm sure it must have been a very tough task uh, even with this conference which in itself is a community gathering um to create a safe space for all of us to gather together um and honestly even with all of this there's going to be a little bit of slippage because no community or person is perfect it's going to you know uh, something is going to slip through the cracks but uh, if anything uh, i'm i'm honestly you know here to say that all of those inclusion efforts that you're having those outreach efforts you're having for diversity candidates they matter 
बिकॉज विदाउट दोज देर आर गोइंग टू बी सेवरल पीपल इन द डार्क हु आर डिजर्विंग ऑफ अपॉर्चुनिटीज एंड इट्स ऑन आज एज कम्युनिटी मेम्बर्स टू एक्चुअली वॉइस दोज आउट एंड बी द चेंज वी वॉन्ट टू सी एंड दट्स अ लिटिल क्लीशे बट या बट वेन इट कम्स टू आस वॉट कैन वी डू अबाउट इट दिस इज something i've repeatedly heard because um, you know people struggle with meetings all the time like i remember when i started out as a contributor in kubernetes two years back um, there were no apac time zone friendly meetings i come from india um, and it was a real struggle because how am i supposed to sit up till 12 am my time to just attend one meeting um, eventually because you know we we it didn't seem like we were getting out of out of a pandemic anytime soon um there was a provision made across um you know the work uh, different groups that were there as part of the project to account for um, apac friendly meetings but that was again not enough because uh, what if a person couldn't actually make it to the meeting what if a person had their daily life come in between what if they couldn't account for you know an in person meeting uh, so we had this whole system brought up uh, at least in the groups that i am part of wherein we also uh, cup, uh, you know had an asynchronous uh, meeting uh, effort underway over and above which we also accounted for asynchronous presence so suppose if you had to actually attend a meeting and couldn't make it and you wanted to you know voice out some points um there would be an agenda documentation ahead of time wherein you actually listed those points and those would be spoken to in the presentation uh sorry not presentation so uh, those would be spoken to in the meeting and um you could view a recording later um if any clarification was required you could ask for ask about it on the slack channel or wherever you feel comfortable um especially uh when you are talking about mentorship opportunities it's not going to be that i am going to find a mentor who is right next to my house that's definitely not going to be possible so if you are a part of a program um and you have the power to make the decision uh always always account for the fact that there are going to be a sync meetings always account for the fact that you might need to cancel some of those zoom and google meet invites that you have sent out um additionally in open source um uh, we go by consensus seeking rather than consensus driven decisions um there's a difference between the two uh the reason being consensus seeking decisions aren't going to be hard and fast on the fact on whether you have gained consensus or not and it is especially important because when you're talking about mentorship opportunities in open source you are engaging the new entrant into the community you are embedding him into the community him her them into the community so it's essential that uh, you know they be familiarized with the fact that um, you know you may have different points of view you may have a difference of opinion but there is going to be a collective um you know discussion about this and something that is seeking consensus rather than you know a person saying that this is the way forward and that's all that that is not the case and it's difficult when you know you come from a setup that is not really the same as open source because i this is this was a paradigm shift for me when i uh, you know realized that decisions here are uh consensus seeking rather than driven because in our day jobs to be honest that's not the case um and last but not the least i think um you know having inclusive um language mandated as part of your daily interactions is a key uh the reason being uh it's essential to not use harmful language in general uh it's um or you know it's it's dif- 
it's difficult for a lot of people out there and using that language is simply not done because now we're a global community. So um, standardizing inclusive language and using that language within your communities is, is exceptionally important. And I think, um, you know, the Inclusion Naming Initiative does a fantastic job of that. Um, I've linked to the website in my resources section so you can have a look later. And uh, some of the ways you can actually um, do the, um, you know, you can actually mandate inclusive language is by using bots to regulate inclusive language usage. It's, it's there on the Kubernetes Slack, so I know that it is possible. Um, but uh, yeah, that brings me to the resources slide which I was talking about and uh, this whole deck will be up on shared once I get home uh, and it will also be available on my GitHub repo. And with that, I think I've reached the logical end of my presentation and thank you so much for your time everyone. I hope you have a fantastic time at the event. Bye-bye. Oh, also I will be open to taking any questions. I forgot to mention that. Sorry. <laughs> Should I start again or did you hear mm, the first part? I, I, I could catch it, but I think it would be better oh, for okay. the recording if you could start again. Sure. So when it comes to mentorship, the mentee usually enters a new technological area that they're not familiar with. Um, what I've found is that there's a challenge of creating a task for them, like an initial task that's vague enough for them to allow them to investigate, but not too specific to give them some room, you know. Um, how do you... Or if, do you have any uh, methods that you recommend to teach them to, you know, think methodically and break down tasks effectively whilst at the same time you're navigating the challenging <laughs> world of open source? Yeah, that's a very good question. And um, honestly speaking, that's a very subjective case, uh, to be honest, because like you said, it's going to be uh, every entrant to the ecosystem is going to have a different level of skills uh, that they bring along with them. So um, when, when I'm assigning tasks or when I'm actually recommending people to work on specific areas of the project, what I uh, first do is I go and uh, you know, have that conversation with them as to what they're comfortable doing. Um, because I understand that you know, uh, even comfort levels vary uh, with respect to a particular technology. And it's not necessary that uh, you know everybody starts at ground uh, at level zero. Some people could be starting at level fifteen, but still be comfortable with doing only level zero tasks because you know they're intimidated. So having that first initial conversation helps. That's one thing. The second thing is um, providing them the res providing them with the resources that they can actually you know start doing tasks with. So. Based, based on the conversation that I have with them, if there are specific resources that I can provide, and there will be because there's a lot of documentation. I don't recommend that all the documentation is good, but uh, <laughs> there will be some documentation in your project uh, that uh, can help them get onboarded to the level of the task that they choose to actually, uh, I mean, that you've chosen for them to work on. and. Uh, Last but not the least, uh, constantly checking in with them. And by constantly, I don't mean pinging every hour, but <laughs> checking in with them and figuring out um, if there is you know, anything that I can personally do or you know, patching them with another resource within the project who'd probably you know, be able to solve their problems better. Um, those are like the three steps I majorly follow because I understand that every, like I start off, I start off my contribution journey in open source with docs. But I understand that not everybody wants to contribute to docs. So that's that's what helped. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I think we just have one minute. So I'll be able to take the last question if there's anything. Or else I'll be at the SUSA booth for a bit. Uh, and we can chat there as well. <laughs>